Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Borderless webinar edition. This edition will be on migration and cultural identity. And I am very happy to welcome our guest speakers and our audience today. So uh, the subject of uh, our webinar today uh, is a subject that touches the lives uh, of migrants in a way or another throughout their migration journey. And since the experience of migration itself is uh, very unique, deep and different from one person to the other, it also leads uh, to some questions regarding uh, identity uh, and the cultural identity may mainly. So how this cultural identity is transformed, shaped, constructed and deconstructed throughout this migration journey. Uh, today we are in this webinar to discuss uh, this uh, subject and this with our guest speakers, uh, who is episode produced by our partner Aliens uh, about uh, migration culture. Since this episode offered us and cultural identity, in this webinar we will be uh, seeing some extracts from this episode and also commenting on these extracts and taking the discussion forward from them. Uh, Borderless is a project implemented by Diaspora in action in with cooperation uh, between uh, Tunisia Tomorrow and Aliens, and it is funded by the French German Citizens Fund. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to our guest speakers to briefly introduce themselves, and I will start uh, with you, guys. So the floor is yours. Hello, welcome everyone. So my name is Kais. I I'm here because I have an experience in migration. I migrated from Tunisia to study in Germany and um, did all my studies here until the PhD, moved a bit also to Singapore, California, back to Germany. So a lot to talk about. Thank you, Kais. And we are also looking forward to hear from your experience. Uh, Hamza, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Hamza Samidi, I'm, I, uh, I'm from Morocco, I came to France uh, 12 years ago for my studies and now uh, I trained as uh, sociologist and anthropologist and uh, as of case I've been uh, living in several countries, now I'm living in Belgium, I also lived a bit in uh, California, so uh, a lot of migrations, inception of migrations. <laughs> yes. Um, that's why I also said in the beginning, we have a very diverse panel today. Uh, thank you very much, Hamza. Uh, Meher, here you go. Thank you, Nisreen. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Meher, uh, Meher sorry. Uh, and uh, I also have been quite around, let's say. Uh, I'm from, I come from Tunisia and I, I went to, I moved to Lebanon to study there for four years. Uh, and I also, I've been and I lived for, for a while in the US, um, then Italy, Spain, Belgium, and now back to Italy. So yeah, uh, the, the topic is very close and dear to my heart. And uh, yeah, I'd be very glad to talk about it today with you all. And nice to meet you all. So it's really a pleasure to meet you. I meet you. Thank you, Maher. We are also happy to have you on board tonight. Uh, Melik? Please, uh, if you can give us a brief introduction about yourself. Yes, thank you, Nasreen. Hi, uh, everyone. So I am Alec. Um, I'm 27. I, I experienced, as in the description, immigration at a very young age. So I left my country of birth, Tunisia, at uh, the age of nine. Um, I was in Qatar with my family, and then I pursued the university in France. Um, now I am working as a consultant uh, in data in France, um, and also I am the co-founder of uh, Aliens, one of the partners of uh, this project Borderless. So uh, I'm more than happy to participate, uh, to talk to you about my um, experience as an immigrant, but also to talk about uh, our vision, why such a project is, is an important project. Um, and yeah, 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Uh, Malik, I think we have we are having uh, do you, I don't do you, know. Do you hear me now? We we did hear you. I think the connection problems are with Nasreen. I don't know if it's from us or from maybe do do the other participants here hear Malik? Everyone, okay. yes. It's uh, just you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Malik. Uh, and I would like also to uh, encourage the audience uh, to leave their questions in the Q&A session, uh, for the Q&A session. So please leave your questions on the Zoom chat and also on the comments section on the Facebook uh, stream. We will then answer, answer your questions later. Uh, now, before we proceed, I would like just to ask our guest speakers, uh, yes or, or no questions. So it will be the answer either yes or no for this question. So I will start with Hamza. Uh, do you define yourself primary primarily or mainly as a migrant? I think um, there is a connection problem. I'm not sure. Yes, uh, I, I didn't hear you quite well, but uh, you asked me if I define myself primarily as a migrant. I think this is actually the only true identity I have. <laughs> So, uh, yes, definitely, yes. Thank you, Hamza. What about you, Mahe? Um, if, I, if I am to answer primarily a migrant, I would say no. But if you ask me just a general question, then yeah. Thank you, Mahe. Uh, guys, how do you define yourself? Uh, do you define yourself primarily as a migrant, yes or no? Um, no, depending on the context. So in some context, I would definitely define myself not as a migrant, just to be clear on that. But yeah. Thank you, guys. Malik? Yeah, I think I... Uh... Yeah, like Kais, uh, in some situations, circumstances, I would define myself primi pr primarily as a migrant, but I think I can be more than that, just a migrant. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, maybe we are facing some internet issues, but we are working on them. We hope that you all us are hearing us now. Uh, we will proceed to uh, showing an extract from the last episode uh, of uh, migration, and, and then we'll be back to the discussion. Identity was a journey. I mean, now I know, like I'm in my early 30s, I know that identity is a construct. But when I was a child and a teenager, I didn't. And I very much just copied what people thought about me from the outside. So like the people I grew up with. And they told me I'm not German. Like everybody told me I'm not German. So I thought, yeah, okay, I'm not German then. So I'm Tunisian because when I'm in Tunisia, people are like, yeah, you're Tunisian, you know? Nobody said like, no, you're not Tunisian. Um, so I chose that nationality as my cultural identity. Like in my mid uh, 20s, I, f I had a kind of uh, identity crisis and I tried to figure out like who I am culturally and um, I just found out that I can define who, who I am um, no matter what anybody else says. So I just decided I'm 100% German and I'm, and I'm 100% Tunisian too. I think it's important to stay true Uh, thank you. Uh, Hamza, my next question is for you. Um, as a researcher in sociology and having this background, uh, what is your comment on this extract that we have just seen? 
Yes, um, I find it to be extremely interesting. It uh, it tells us that uh, <coughs> culture, how one defines oneself, is a uh, very uh, um, it moves a lot during uh, one's life, uh, um, and also it it says this need, this primary need we all. Um, experience to define oneself to uh, know what we are she said that uh, she had a uh, yes uh, uh, identity crisis when she was in her mid 20s and that uh, prior to that uh, uh, she reacted uh, to uh, um, the uh, common racism in Germany to, by saying that she, yes indeed she was Tunisian and not uh, not German I think this is also a very true component of uh, how we understand modern identity it's uh, it uh, functions a lot by its negative. Uh, what we are not, what we are, uh, and uh, of course, I, I, I'm sure that uh, many of us here uh, um, never felt more Tunisian or Moroccan or some um, to the day that they were in France or Germany or Italy or uh, wherever they were. Uh, this is a very common uh, trend. Uh, um, yes, and uh, I think all migrants uh, tend to face it, uh, but it also has its own uh, um, uh, problems. So one tends to perform at some times, uh, to perform its own, one's own uh, Tunisianity or Moroccanity or, <laughs> or Islamity, or I don't know, every, uh, what, uh, what's uh, your cultural background. Yes. Yeah, so you are like here referring, referring more to the pressure that the migrants feel in their journey to identify themselves. Okay, thank you, uh, Hamza. Uh, so um, my next question is for both Ais and Meher, and I will start with Meher and then move to Kais. So um, when you hear the question, the very famous question that we all hear, where are you from? So how do you react to this question, Meher? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Nisreen. Um... Actually, if I'm being completely honest with you, and I am going to be very honest in this webinar, uh, I usually react with some discomfort in the sense that, because I'm always thinking of the prejudice that my, the, counterpart, the counterpart might have if I say, for instance, my country. So I'm always like, I'm, I get a little bit com uncomfortable when someone asks me the question because this means that they they noticed or like they they saw me as different and so they asked me where I'm from you know so I, I don't necessarily take it uh, as yeah oh it's nice like you know they're they're curious to get to know me more I'm, I'm very defensive when it comes to this question so if I, I meet someone for the first time and this is the first thing they ask me then I'm like oh oops so I'm the stranger so I'm the foreigner you know so I'm always having these um yeah, it's, I, I get very, very uncomfortable. Uh, I've been working on that in the sense that I always uh, like try to see, okay, maybe they just want to know me. Um, but most of the cases, I'm always also assuming the worst. So um, I would think, okay, uh, maybe if someone tells me, oh, I've been to Tunisia, it's, it's a nice place, you know? Deep down, I still feel that maybe they're not telling, telling me the truth. You know, maybe they, they don't like it. Maybe they think it's, 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 a, it's a horrible place, but they can't tell to my face. So I'm having a lot of insecurities about the question itself. Um, but yeah, this is because I'm also all, try, always thinking of what the other might think or what kind of image is portrayed of my country uh, abroad. So it does create some, some sort of discomfort if I'm being completely honest. Thank you very much, Meher. And I think we all need this honesty because this um, subject is very personal also. And uh, the more we talk about it in an open and honest way, I think the more the, um, we can deconstruct uh, everything about it. Um, so, Kais, uh, how about you? Do you feel the same discomfort that Meher is describing when you are asked this question? or it's okay just a very normal question that does not bother um i would differentiate between the context so if i'm in an event where it's an international conference and everyone is coming from a different place and i get that question i don't feel that it's an aggressive question so i just answer probably my institution in germany and then i say i'm originally from tunisia and so on but there are indeed some contexts where you feel from the question that someone is trying to put you on the side on the margin, like uh, differentiate you from us, like you are different. And then 
I mean, after living here for so long and getting also the nationality, I can just play the game and say I'm German and I'm from this city in Germany. And then they would ask again and then I would say, yeah, I used to live actually in this area. That's why I speak this accent also. And then I would just pretend that I didn't get it. So I would really play the game. I mean, um, yeah, no need to be. I mean, I, I feel I empathize with my hair, but I just moved beyond that stage. And I'm also quite aggressive in my answer. I am not, I'm not in the defensive here. What I, what happened in the past is that I used to say I'm um, Germany, but I was born in Tunisia or like I, I am um, Tunisian, but I have lived in Germany. I, I changed that, but I used to use this uh, differentiation. Now I'm, I'm say and, so I, I say I'm German and I'm also Tunisian or like I'm Tunisian, and I'm also German citizen, something like that. So uh, it's an additive thing, not, not a, a contrast anymore for me. Thank you. It's um, very interesting, this complementarity point. And I was just curious, guys, were you, did you feel like uh, being able to use this and more like um, after getting the citizenship, you are feeling like you can get like this, uh, you know, uh, aggressive, as you mentioned, or just be yourself more after getting this paper? Yeah. It's definitely after getting the citizenship, but even after getting it, I was still using this but i'm also from there and then consciously i made the decision that it shouldn't be but but it should be and and then it's it was a conscious decision yeah yeah because yeah it's at the end of the day today you are both so and also as ines said she is 100 percent german and also 100 percent tunisian uh thank you very much Kais and Mahe. uh so now my question is uh for you, Malik, uh, do you feel sometimes like you are reduced uh, to your identity as a migrant? So maybe you, you get this feeling that people or you're um, at work or in life in general or your um, the, uh, the friends that you studied with or your community in general reduces you to your identity as a migrant. Do you get this feeling and how do you react? How do you feel when you are faced with this reduction to only your identity as a migrant when defining who Malik is? Okay, I, I will answer the, the first part of the question. Um, I don't, I won't use the, the word reduced, but maybe uh, intentionally reminded of my, my immigration or um, yeah, the fact that I am a migrant. Because if you think of it as they are considered like you are reduced, then it means you are inferior to other people. And I don't think uh, being a migrant is somehow being inferior to others. I think it's a richness to be a migrant. Um, how do I feel being like um, uh, intentionally reminded of my immigration? I think like if it's in a bad way, it's if it's with a bad attitude, I'm just feeling sorry for the person in front of me because I think like um, having the, exp having, uh, like living this experience, going through immigration, discovering other people, other cultures, it's 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 better than just staying in one place and then never discovering anything. I'm not like saying everyone should migrate or something like that. It's just um, like it gives you uh, more richness. Uh, it gives you more opportunities to understand others. Uh, like around you um, so yeah I'm, I really don't feel uh, angry about being reminded of it uh, but then I also try also to to offer those people who would look to me as someone who's um, just a migrant I would just try to convince them that it's not you know just push them to uh, discover uh, maybe travel sometimes I think it's it's good Thank you, Malik. Definitely the experience of migration, uh, I personally think it's very enriching and it adds a lot to our journey and our lives. And it's definitely something uh, that makes us uh, unique also because we have been, we experienced this with all its package. Um, so going back uh, to you, Mahe, um, with this question, 
So um, if you compare yourself now to uh, someone of your friends who did not migrate or stay back home, uh, how do you describe the evolution of your identity and uh, personality compared to that person who didn't go throughout the same journey of migration as you did? I mean, what, what changed along the way for you? Oh, everything. <laughs> I think everything changed. But uh, if I'm putting this into perspective, um, I must say that uh, I had the infrastructure for all the change that happened in the sense that I do believe that before leaving my home country, uh, I was very open. Like I was, I sought the differences, whether may they be cultural or any other kind of difference. I was, I was like thirsty, if you want, for that. And this was one of the main motivations for me to, to, to move around, uh, find oppor opportunities abroad. So this intrinsic motivation kind of helped me also embrace the change that happened afterwards. And so I, I think at least in my, in my, in my opinion, also the experiences um, people have when they migrate, they really differ, like they really vary from one person to another. So I do believe also in the personality traits. So if you are, if you have some, um, if you are open to experience uh, and you're flexible, then you're most likely to, to, uh, to have for example, worldviews change, um, some ideas, ideologies, um, also the way you perceive others and the way, the way you perceive the world, because that happened to me, but it did not come from nowhere. It's not like I changed 180% degree, for instance. It came step by step, so I think it was like in a healthy kind of way, so I did not wake up from one day to another and I'm like, oh my god, I changed completely. It was just like bits and pieces happening throughout the way, um and i embraced all of them so uh so yeah i do believe that living abroad or migrating affects the way we are and affects also the way we perceive things but i'm also very aware that it does not happen happen um similarly across dif across different individuals who maybe have the same path so i think it's also an individual kind of uh, there's individual um uh side of it so uh yeah i don't know if i answered your question but i hope i did yeah, you did actually because i also had like a follow-up question to, to, to see with you um the, the things that you acquired or the our change in your personality would you have acquired them if it was not for the migration or if when you are back you you feel really like estranged or uh, completely like different with regard to some of your family members or friends who did not migrate do you get to live this feeling or yeah 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 uh with my friends luckily i'm surrounded either in my home country or abroad by like-minded friends so it, which is actually not a very good thing because it kind of creates a bubble. So you think everyone is like that when it's not. Uh, but I do feel the friction more with my family members in the sense that I do feel, for instance, that my worldviews could be very different from theirs. And it feels very uncomfortable again because, I mean, they are the root, no? So it's uncomfortable both ways, either for them or for me. Uh, and I think it's even more uncomfortable for them because they haven't left the country, so they haven't migrated. So they don't know what it feels like to live abroad. Um, and so I, I'm guessing it's even more difficult from them, for them. Um, but yeah, the way I deal with it is that I try to understand this, this context, to so understand where I am and understand where they are. Um, and I try also to reflect on all of my experiences abroad and say, okay, maybe if they had the opportunity to live those experiences, they would have seen things differently, you know? So I always reflect on that when it comes to my family members, but I also think it's it's also something very individual in the sense that if one of my family members is not very open to new experiences, then I think even if they go abroad, their worldviews, for instance, won't change that much, you know? So it, it's both, it's, it's the environment, the context, but also your personality, how you are as a person. Yeah, this is the end. I think also Hamza, you can jump on this uh, because sometimes it's like this trend when people migrate. Do you hear me now, guys? 
Okay, so when people migrate, they sometimes, um, there are some communities like who try like to preserve this much their identity because they feel like they will lose it. So, so they tend to be extreme, but the, like the intention, the, maybe the primary one is like to preserve this identity from, from uh, being lost. So also this, I don't know in sociology or um, how, how you can uh, reflect on this from your background or your experiences or the research you did. I don't know. I, I think first, uh, maybe one should say that there is no universal experience of migration. I, I, I was, as, as of you guys, I, I was uh, born and raised in a third world country in Morocco. Uh, and uh, I knew a lot of French people who were living in Morocco and they never experienced their life in Morocco as a migra migration. They were like living uh, this very nice life uh, in a bit sunnier weather than the in France, and this was very nice. And uh, there was no uh, existential question to them, <laughs> to their being in Morocco. So uh, I think that uh, uh, we should maybe specify a little bit what what we are. We will live together, uh, together, not together, but each one of us. Uh, and uh, it's um, yes, it's post-colonial immigration. First, we, we we came from countries that were colonized, that we came to our colonizers. So it's a bit different from uh, you know just French people coming to Morocco and having a nice time at the beach and. Uh, and under the, uh, I don't know, the the nice sunny trees. Uh, so uh, I think one should say that this uh, uh, also this uh, uh, phenomenon of identity, how you define yourself, it's also always come from a very difficult place, very difficult subjective place. Uh, migration, uh, at least post-colonial migration, is very hard. Uh, we had to fight for our papers. Uh, personally, I came to France. Uh, uh, I was 17 years old. I knew nobody at all. Uh, I was in the city. I knew absolutely nobody. And they had to have papers and uh, to go to the prefecture where people to talk very down to you. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it, I, I have friends uh, who this uh, experience drove them crazy. I mean, literally, not, uh, not just uh, figuratively, not literally. I have friends who ended up in uh, psychiatric hospitals or had, uh, had very bad time. Migration is hard. It's very hard. And I always... Uh, uh, I don't know, very subjectively, I always tend to uh, ask myself the question uh, if it was all worth it. I mean, uh, of course, I had I did my studies. Now I'm a, uh, um, a researcher at the university here in Belgium. It's very nice, it's, uh, but it has a very huge cost <laughs> on, uh, on one's, uh, uh, I don't know, subjectivity life. And I'm not speaking even of the, uh, uh, the bonds that has been severed. To uh, to family, to to friends, to uh, to all of uh, all of this. So I don't know. I, I maybe we can just say this that there is no universal experience of migration, and uh, yes, and also uh, um, we are all trying to cope with something that is uh, at its heart very dramatic. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's definitely sometimes it's like easy and do you hear me now? Okay, um, we are, sorry, I'm sorry if there are some sound problems. Uh, so I was just saying that it's definitely a free and not easy experience. Uh, and yeah, we can all, uh, we have all our anecdotes and stories about how difficult it can get. Uh, so uh, now uh, we move to the second uh, axis of our um, webinar, which will be uh, focused on culture. The first one that we just dealt with was about identity, and now we are moving to culture. Uh, we will open with this uh, extract uh, from our last um, episode. So let's watch it together, and then we will come back to you, Hamza. Thank you. To stay true to my culture, because I don't want to forget it, but it's also important to be open to receive fragments of the German culture. But in the end, it's my choice of what I want to accept from the German culture and uh, the parts that I want to keep from my own. It's about catching and releasing, so that's why I said it's individual. Everybody decides for themselves what they want to keep and what not. Um, Hamza, uh, this question is for you. If, so we, will, we are talking about culture. So uh, can you help our audience understand what does culture mean like in a scientific way? Uh, and how do cultures interact with each other in the context 
of migration. Yes, uh, first of all, let me say that I'm very shocked that you uh, interrupted the very nice uh, oud playing. So uh, this is not <laughs> a good point for you. Um, just, uh, just kidding, of course. Let's say, yes, um, it was very interesting to hear. Uh, I think her name was Ihram, I think. Um, hear her speaking about her relationship to culture. Of course, as you know, culture is very uh, central and defining uh, even uh, uh, concepts for social sciences. Uh, you know, this whole and very old opposition between nature and culture and culture is uh, what defines human beings and so on so this is very uh, uh, actually it's very outdated because now we know that uh, um, even animals even the uh, uh, even trees actually they they communicate to each other so they have their own form of culture but it, at least it says to us that uh, culture is not uh, something that it is um, as opposed to how we use it, we tend to use it in the common uh, uh, language, is not something that is opposed to one's way of life. It's embedded in uh, in life, in, 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 in language, in, uh, in how we interact with each other. It's not um, uh, a separate sphere. You know, you have your culture, which is very far, and, uh, and you can access it at some point, and at some other points, uh, you just decide to, you know, not, uh, yet not interact with it. Uh, culture is actually one's way of, one's way of life. Um, and the uh, is the actual resources, social resources, intellectual, psychological, even religious. Uh, one has to face life and interact with the fellow beings. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I heard Ihram saying that for her, it's it's an individual um, decision. And I agree, but culture is obviously about community. <laughs> and uh, in her, except except she says so. She says that uh, it was very important for her in Berlin to to find community. In, uh, I think in the uh, in the, the rest of her uh, of her talk, um, and yes, so culture is uh, to me it's very much about establishing complicity and attachment uh, at uh, a very intimate level. And of course, it's not always possible. <laughs> at some point, it's not possible. It's not possible because you do not you do not have the same language and have the same view of life of uh, how to interact with others, how to be part of the world. But if you have to define culture, it's just the way we, as human beings, uh, we find to cope with life, you know, to how to understand our being here, how to understand uh, what we should do with our lives. Uh, but still, there is no culture if there is no uh, community. Uh, and I think if we think uh, culture as uh, resources, as resources we have to face life, um, I think it it may. Um, makes it may, it may make sorry uh, immigration or migration easier to understand uh, because some resources they they lose all value when one migrates and this is very shocking when you when you migrate you think that you i don't know it can even be diplomas you know you have this very good doctors coming from morocco tunisia or i don't know where and they come from to france and their diplomas they are not recognized they not uh, they, they have no value <laughs> all of a sudden because just because they they went from a country to another and it's true for all our resources and our cultural resources at uh, uh, at the at, uh, at, uh, at uh, the heart of uh, the immigration experience i have a friend a very dear friend to me which was a a Syrian evolutionary so he was a, he, he actually uh, i don't know uh, lived something that could be uh, at the heart of a very good novel or very good film or a very extreme and uh, um, incredible life and uh, so he had to flee Syria and he came to France and all of a sudden nobody was interested in here in his experience in what he uh, he experienced as a I don't know as a revolutionary as a, someone who had a history and so on uh, so I think yes uh, uh, if we have to understand the culture it's I think something that's more closest to closer to resources, to resources we have to uh, face life. And there are always, uh, um, I don't know, uh, communal resources. Um, but also, I, I want to uh, insist on this point because uh, we tend to say culture as if it was folklore. And folklore is nothing but uh, dead culture. <laughs> folklore is not, you know, it's just the uh, the thing you have. I, I'm sure in Tunisia you have the same, but in Morocco we have the national television and they do this very folkloric shows and it's very nice to see people, but nobody lives like this anymore. You know, it's just a, uh, it's a pale representation of something that maybe ha happened to, to exist. Uh, uh, I don't know when exactly, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's nothing else than dead culture. Culture is necessarily a life. It's necessarily a way to cope with life. Um, and it's also necessarily moving. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for this explanation. 
Thank you for this explanation, Hamza, and thank you guys for the sound remarks. Also for uh, Karsina and Melek and the audience, if you would like to interact um, about uh, what uh, Hamza just said or mentioned, if you have like some remarks or comments or personal stories, please uh, feel free uh, to share them with us. This is um, an yeah. interesting uh, panel. Hey, can I say something about what Hamza just said? I think I, I do agree with everything you mentioned, especially that there's, I really liked when you said there's no universal experience of migration. I really think it's, it's very, um, it's, it really depends on where you come from and where you're go, going. So obviously if there's some power, some historic um, historical colonization, uh, like some colonizing history in the past, that's what I wanted to say, then it, it changes everything. So, um, and the way, also the way people perceive you, where you're coming from and where you are at the moment. I'm, I completely agree with that. And uh, regarding your last point about, for, for instance, folklore and how it's like that culture and how in our home countries, they tend to perpetuate these images, these scenes uh, of, of folklore as if like it's our, as if it's like our current culture when it's not. So the idea here is that culture is not static, it's very dynamic and it's changing. Um, so uh, I just want to comment on that, that this is actually very true. And uh, I think also with globalization today, especially young people, uh, millennials, if you want, I mean, <laughs> they have, I, I, I tend to say they have like zero connection with with all of the folkloric scenes that they are that we are seeing on TV, for instance, maybe our generation we have like we've seen or or we've witnessed something, but the newer generations they don't they can't relate. They simply can't relate uh, because it feels like it was very 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 old. And so yeah, it's also about how in our home societies how we are perceiving culture because that's also it really affects our personal culture so if, if, I'm, a, if I'm a 17 year old girl for instance in Tunisia or Morocco or Algeria and I'm watching the American series and, and movies all the time for instance maybe I like my culture like my current culture is affected by what I'm consuming so here we'll also talk about media consumption and how and how it affects our own culture I remember when I went to the US for the first time it was, I only went there once and I had this very strange feeling of familiarity as if I knew, as if I've grown up there and I've only just got there, you know? And then I was like, oh my God, this is, it must be all of the movies and, and series that gave me this sense of familiarity with the American culture or all that we're talking about Tunisia, North Africa and the US, you know? I'm not even talking about France, for instance. So I think another very interested, uh, interesting um, access or dimension we could also um, investigate or, or discuss later on or in general is also media and culture, the effect of how media today is um, uh, shaping the way we perceive culture as individuals. Totally. Uh, thank you, um, thank you for uh, this. Um, interesting uh, input. Um, guys, so I think you will have a lot to say about this question. <laughs> so I will shoot. So uh, what do you think about the concept of a guiding culture? Guiding culture, like maybe just to simplify it more to our audience, like if we refer to a culture that is like the culture of a given society, the reference, what do you think about this? Have you experienced? Yeah, do you have half an hour? No. Um, okay, short answer, I hate the concept. Uh, long answer, I mean, uh, there is a discussion, there is this term in, in German, they call it Leitkultur. And um, it, I mean, let me borrow from what Hamza said about the definition of culture. And I would emphasize the fact that, okay, when we are born in a certain environment and we move to another environment, we bring with us a different um, value system, a different code of conduct, a different taste, a different language, and so on, a way to communicate. And um, when we move to another a new environment, we have to somehow adapt to the way things are communicated in that new environment, uh, what the, the code of conduct is, and so on. So in a sense, there is a pragmatic 
Uh, in a pragmatic way, I would say there is some sort of guiding culture that makes life easier in the host environment, the new environment. But what I hate about the concept is that it, under all this shiny layers of pragmatism, there is a core that is a bit racist and um, has layer, some sense of superiority because it kind of involves this idea that there is a true culture or a code of conduct that is good and everything else is inferior to it, maybe bad, not, not as evolved as this code of conduct. And that's something that I just disagree with. I mean, we don't have, it's not as strong, let's say, if there isn't this post-colonial migration, as you said, like this relationship between a former colonizer, powerful uh, culture and uh, as a sub, uh, a culture that is subordinated, so to say, in historical terms, even though I just hate to use even those words when I'm explaining my argument. It's just, yeah. So I, I'm totally against uh, this concept. I think um, cultures are of equivalent values, but indeed there is some need to, to be pragmatic, to adapt to the host culture in order to just be able to communicate and live and then perform and so on. Yeah. So maybe in this case, like the challenge is how to adapt in this pragmatic way to the guy, this culture while being true to your own culture or what you choose to keep from your own culture as well, or to bring also the value added or what you would like to let the, the host country or your uh, friends in the host country or community know about your own culture. So um, this will lead me to my uh, next question to Malik. Um, we generally, Malik, feel like uh, we as migrants, not all of us, uh, not to generalize also, but we have like this um, obligation to be the best ambassadors of our culture and uh, to show the good things about our culture. It's like kind of duty that you feel uh, or some migrants feel or impose somehow either consciously or unconsciously to themselves. So uh, what do you think about this, Malik? Do you, what do you think about this idea? Do you think that uh, it's our duty uh, to be ambassadors of our cultures as migrants? Yeah, I, I I think it's it's true actually, but I think of it like more of a, a natural process as you know we are too much connected to our past. Uh, our past is a part of us, so then we are actually ambassadors of our past and uh, thus to our culture. But then like something funny happened this year. I traveled to to Kenya and then I met people that like like uh, people from Africa. Uh, from Namibia, from uh, Kenya, from, you know, uh, and then what, what was funny is that I was more enthusiastic uh, about telling them about Tunisia than uh, I was in France. I don't know why, but I think that French would perceive you in a way, uh, and then all Europeans would perceive you in a way that you won't feel really ent enthusiastic about talking about your country. But then Africans, like from our con from my continent, they were too much happy to know that I came to visit Kenya and that I was from Tunisia. Um, so yeah, uh, um, another thing is that like today I'm working like on this project Borderless. It covers immigration, and I think I am more an ambassador of uh, being. Uh, a migrant, so the mi the migration culture, then uh, an ambassador of uh, my culture as a Tunisian. You know, uh, I think I yeah, and this is related more to what I've been living in the past ten years than what I've been living like twenty years ago. So yeah, I think um, you are actually an ambassador of who you are, and to today maybe I define myself like uh, as an so, like as as we said earlier, uh, somehow as a migrant, but more than that, and then 
So I would try to, to talk about uh, migration in general. Um, I would just go back to what um, uh, Hamza said earlier about uh, culture uh, being alive and not dead. Um, and that's something also that um, I feel like uh, through migration, I've lived so many things today. I am living migration. So I would say it's uh, it makes part of my um, cultural background now uh, and cultural present. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think um, I am more ambassador to that than uh, my historic or uh, national culture. Thank you, Malik. Um, you are the best ambassador for me. At least I can testify that. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, now uh, we will move to the uh, last axis of our webinar. It will be about integration. And we will start with the video that we will uh, show now. And then uh, I will uh, ask Hamza a question regarding this extract. Thank you. Mes parents sont habitués de Tunisie, je suis né à Paris. Euh, forcément, tout ce que mes parents m'ont inculqué, c'est ce qu'ils ont appris en Tunisie. Et en banlieue, il y avait beaucoup de, comme mes parents, d'immigrés, d'immigrés de, de tous les pays d'Europe. Et on arrivait à vivre tous ensemble. On arrivait à s'entendre avec certains, tu t'entends mieux qu'avec qu d'autres. Et chacun, il a sa culture. Maintenant, chacun, il est avec sa culture. Et, Est-ce qu'il va l'inculquer à ses voisins à l'époque Non. Est-ce qu'il va l'inculquer à ses, à ses enfants pour qu'ils aient le souvenir Normalement, euh, oui. Hein. Mais ça ne veut pas dire qu'on on fait aussi partie de la France. Et on est aussi français à part entière. Identity was a journey. I mean... We have seen in this uh, extract um, René's uh, perception of integration. Uh, how would you define it, this concept, word, buzzword of integration? Um, yeah, I think I was very interested in what René said. Uh, I think there is really two parts in the, what he said. His, uh, he used a, a word that I do like very much, which is a souvenir. Uh, he said that uh, his parents uh, transmitted to him uh, the souvenir, the souvenir of uh, um, obviously Tunisia, obviously also I think Jewish life in, in Tunisia, a heritage, inheritance, uh, not to forget uh, one's, not culture. I, I, again, I do not like much, much this term of uh, culture used like this in the common tongue, but uh, uh, not to forget one's own people and own community and own history and so on. Um, so I think the souvenir is very important. I think that's, uh, uh, yeah, there is this uh, very famous uh, German philosopher, Walter Benjamin, who said that we owe something to the dead. And I think I, I agree with that, uh, that we should uh, uh, keep the souvenir of the, the, the dead uh, um, with us. Um, I was also really interested, if I may, with the uh, what Ihram said. Uh, I think uh, she was saying that she was from Kenya. So obviously, I think she was from a, um, a very old immigration to Kenya, which is uh, the Indian immigration to Kenya, which is uh, which has uh, more than a century. And uh, so, when she says that she uh, is uh, faithful or truthful to her culture, it's um, it's a culture that it is at the same time a, a migrating culture, which has more than a century of migration. And in the same time, she's uh, uh, she's saying that it is her own culture. So I think here again, it's more the rule of souvenir, which is important. I think it's absolutely necessary. I think we cannot live without <laughs> this uh, role of souvenir. As of uh, the second part of what he's saying, uh, which is the uh, um, yes, the idea of being French. <laughs> um, I think this is a, a maybe a little more complicated to me, at, at least. Uh, being French for me does not mean anything. <laughs> uh, I lived twelve years in France. Uh, I do not. I can. I cannot say that I am French because I didn't ask for French citizenship. I don't want. I don't want it for reasons even I can't really understand. But <laughs> at the same time. Uh, I cannot say that I'm not French, you know, I, I've lived most of my, my adult life in France, so <laughs> how can you understand this? Uh, how, how can I say I am French or I am not French? But I think what René wants, uh, this means one thing, it means that integration is not... Uh, 
is not something that one should aim for. Integration is or already happened the moment you set a foot in the country you immigrated to. Uh, integration is not, it's just participating to the society you immigrated to. It's not a, like a political goal, you know, we should all be integrated, but you are all integrated. You all go to the bakery, you all go to, I don't know, uh, you work, you study, you, 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 you meet people, I don't know, you become involved with them and so on. So this is, this is integration, this is sociological integration. There's nothing more in integration than that. There is one thing more, which is political integration. And political integration, it has nothing to do with, uh, I don't know, claiming the fact that being French, maybe it's even the opposite. It's having a word uh, in the very making of society. I, I mean, in uh, having a word in the rules that govern society. And as you all experience, uh, we are not very often as uh, migrants offered this opportunity to having a word in the rules which governs, uh, which governs our uh, society in, in which we live in. Uh, no matter how how much how many years we lived in, maybe I don't know. Maybe you can find people who is from who are from like third generation immigration, but still the facts remain. Um, what we should aim for is not being French or not being French or, or being integrated. It's this uh, this having a word in the in the in the, in the rules that govern society. So. Uh, really interesting, and I think it's relatable. Uh, I'm just curious to know. Uh, you said you don't, you you have this dilemma of not feeling you are French, but you can relate to being French. Um, what about your um, being as Moroccan, you, Mor the Moroccan side? I think I would give you exactly the same answer. I I, I am Moroccan. I I, I mean, it means that. Uh, the people I'm, I feel faithful to are all in Morocco. Not all, maybe there is maybe one or two people in France, but most of them are in Morocco, okay, very clearly. Um, and these are the people I, I love. These are the people which live with me in my head. <laughs> so uh, I think, yeah, of course, uh, uh, I feel very bound to Morocco. But at the same time, I do not like my Moroccan passports. I do not like the, the flag of Morocco. I do not like the national anthem of Morocco. I do not feel bound by that at all. I do not feel that... Uh, uh, no, this uh, I feel bound to the people, to the people of Morocco. Yes, absolutely. Yes, they are my people, and they are the people I, I, I yeah, I feel uh, um, faithful to. But uh, I do not feel that this representation, this very cold and and uh, and dead representation of culture, of national culture, of national being, uh, has anything to do with the experience of life. So, so, so I think it's exactly the same thing in, in France than in Morocco. And also in Morocco, I do not have a say in what's, uh, what are the rules governing society. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so my question now is that there is no question so far for all of you, and I will also invite the audience to leave either yes or no about this question. Um, can, can you repeat, please? We, we can't hear you. Okay, thank you. So the next question, it's also a yes. No question, and I will be asking this question to you, uh, the guest speakers, but I also invite the audience in the Zoom chat or on Facebook to leave a, a yes or no uh, answer to this question, uh, either on the Zoom chat or on the Facebook comments section. So the question is simple. I will start with you, Kaz. Uh, do you feel integrated? Uh, yes. And I don't allow anyone to say no to me being integrated or not. Okay, thank you. Mahe? Yeah, for right now, I, I started to feel uh, to feel integrated. And if you asked me two years ago, I would have said no. Hamza? <laughs> yes, I live in like, this country, so <laughs> I think yes, yes. Uh, Melek? Uh, I would say yes, yes, in a way. And it looks like yes is uh, from here on the Zoom chat. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe we got different shades of yes. It's not the same yes. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay. Uh, okay. So, all right. Like, let me discuss before we move to the next question. Your shade of yes, because you have a shade of yes. Where's we didn't hear you in the stream, sorry. Okay, so, no, sorry. Uh, I am sorry for the quality of the sound. So I uh, I was so, uh, asking Kais about his shade of the yes. 
uh, because he said yes, but I don't allow anyone to question my integration. So if you can tell us more about this, will you put in a situation personally where you were questioned about this integration or you yourself witness or heard about such situation? No, no, not really like that, but I also wouldn't even allow that situation to arise. <laughs> so I, um, I don't think anyone is anyone else is qualified to judge whether I am uh, integrated or not. Uh, I am a functioning citizen of the society. As uh, Hamza said, that's like my own criteria. I can function in the society. And thus for me, I'm totally integrated. I don't have the same taste, the same humor maybe than people around me because of our different backgrounds, but that doesn't mean that I'm not integrated. Thank you, uh, Hans. Uh, if uh, you have, um, yes, we have a question for you, Hans, but you can choose to answer now or later about the meaning of integration. What does it mean uh, to you? Uh, but we can uh, go back to this uh, question. It's really like this concept. Uh, like for me, integration is being able to to function within the society. None and um, when. Yeah, then, yeah, there are other words like inclusion, for example. Uh, what's the difference between integration and inclusion? Yeah, th we, there are different shades uh, in the discussion. I think it's something to discuss together. So I would allow, or I would like to hear what the others think about that. We'll go to this question also, we'll write it later. So, um, Melek, uh, from uh, your personal um, experience, uh, so far, so what are the institutions uh, that you think should do something uh, to facilitate uh, integration based on your own experience or on your own expectations? Yeah, I, I would I would first give my my own definition of integration. Um, I don't think integration is um, making conformity or forcing conformity in a society. Uh, I think it's more of accepting diversity and uh, the two like uh, like if you reject diversity then uh, then the people who wouldn't like uh, uh, like do it or wouldn't accept it then you would say they are not integrated I think that's the wrong thing but if you accept them as they are and then you try to uh, make them functional as uh, as I said I, I think then it's a good definition for, for integration for me. About the institutions that have something, like have to do something to, to facilitate integration, I can think of too many. Um, I'll, and, uh, but then it's, I think, a complex question because the links between the different institutions are too many as well. I would first think of the public institutions, the government. Um, the government should should be the one who's making low projects, who is who is facilitating integration. Uh, but then governments, especially in Europe, uh, which is like um, a democratic uh, continent, are uh, elected by people. So I think it's also uh, the the duty of the people to be like. Um, helpful to to those who are migrating and be understanding and try also to make integration uh easy for them uh then i will think also of the media and maha mentioned media before uh, i think media plays uh, a very big role in integration what what it diffuses uh in like uh, in the news or in like as information is very important to how locals and how people perceive immigration and migrants. Um, and then the media, the like the people behind are not um, necessarily public, they might be private, which means that the agenda of the media can be changed, which means that integration might be different, uh, like the perception of, an, of integration uh, and how it's uh, promoted uh, and how migration is promoted might be in, in a way or another. So 
primarily I'm, I'm thinking of public institutions, the government, then behind the people and then the media as they might be uh, responsible uh, and they have to play also a role in, in making integration facilitated and, and better for, for migrants. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Uh, if thanks, Hamza or Meha have any follow up about uh, this question, uh, please uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, otherwise, I will move to the uh, next question to Mahe. Uh, so, according to you, Mahe, um, how do you see the concept of um, diversity and inclusion uh, as opposed to integration? So, are these two contradicting concepts, according to you? Uh, okay, I would probably separate diversity and inclusion. So I would I would put diversity on the side and then put inclusion and integration on the other and see if there are any contrasts. Because, um, because integration, like inclusion, um, has a bit of integration, but diversity is like just the fact of being different from each other, you know? So being having a diverse society that does not necessarily mean having integrated individuals within society it does not necessarily mean that this society is inclusive so you know like nowadays uh, fortunately or unfortunately there are a lot of organizations that are um, using the diversity token and their personnel to like to do some sort of employer branding. So, oh, uh, it's, it, it, it becomes some sort of competition. So for instance, during the LGBT month, all the, the big corps, for instance, they would have a logo like uh, the rainbow flag. They would preach about gender equality and all of that only because they think they play the diversity token. So they're not necessarily acting on, on, on these values. They're just using them to attract people and say, oh, look at us, we're really cool. Uh, when in reality, these are two different things. So because society, and if we're talking about nature, like if we're looking in nature, there's diversity everywhere in all the species, all the creatures, including also human beings and their diversities. So in fact, no one can debunk or can be against diversity because it exists on its own. It's a fact. What should be done though is working on inclusion, belonging and integration. And here I'm quoting, I'm qu quoting um, to authors, Liz Fosslian and Molly West Duffy, that they say something, a statement that I really like. So they say, diversity is having a seat at the table inclusion is having a voice and belonging is having that voice be heard. And I really believe that we're just doing the, the first part, which is having a seat at the table, but no one cares about you. Okay, you're there, okay. So check, we have the diversity token there, but no one cares about you. No one listens to you and your voice is not being heard. So if I am to reflect, to go back now to migration and having diverse society where people come from different cultures and live together, um, um, here, I tend to disagree with the sociological approach or lens through which um, Hamza uh, was explaining earlier. I don't think integration happens automatically. I think there's a lot of work, a lot of work that comes from both sides, from the individual and the host society. Because integration, and here I'm also, I'm also thinking about the relational aspect of integration. So me, vis-a-vis -vis other people with me in society. So if, if I don't, do not speak this, this, the common language with other people, how the hell am I integrated? For instance, I'm gonna talk about my personal experience. When I first got to Italy three years ago, I felt very isolated, à la limite, alienated. And that's because I did not speak the language. So if I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm just gonna um, tell you a small anecdote, like the, the daily, um, like insignificant uh, activities, for instance, going to the supermarket, uh, having chit chats with the, the cashier. I could not do that because I did not speak the language. So the only way of communication was trying to smile every now and then, and it, it made me feel very, very isolated. So this is why I, I said earlier, if you asked me this question, do you feel integrated two years ago? I said, no. 
uh, and maybe maybe this is my personal experience of it. So uh, because I am, I consider myself as someone who's very social. So for me, communicating with other people is very important, and it is part of me feeling integrated. So part of me feeling uh, being feeling part of of the group, whichever the group it is, like whether here in work in in like daily life. If there is a barrier in this communication in this ensemble of being of being part of this ensemble, then I am not integrated. So this is from the individual perspective. From the government or the host society perspective, there is a lot to work to be done as well, because um, integration means that migrants have the same rights as the local citizens, S same rights for education, access to work, healthcare everything and unfortunately this is not always the case in, in in most countries so migrants with the bureaucracy they suffer a lot to achieve this so this is why i really think it does not it's not automatic and i think it, it really reflects the st the status of your migration so if you are if you have the nationality then you can say with confidence like, like guys hell yeah i'm german and i bet you like not bet you and i dare you if you could uh, debunk that you're legitimate. So here we're talking about legitimacy as well. If I'm not at that position, if I am still struggling with the paperwork, then I cannot say that with confidence, you know? So here we're also talking about the whole bureaucratic legitimacy of being or feeling integrated with this, within the society. In my case, I don't have my paperwork done, but I do feel integrated. And that's because I feel that I can communicate with other people. So whatever the social context I'm in, if I can communicate, if the people hear me, and my concerns, then that's it. I'm integrated, I'm included. So I, I talked more about the social re re relational aspect because I think it's also important. It's like what defines any social group, you know, after all you're not, I mean, we can't, for me, it's, it's just like, it's compulsory to talk about that when we talk about integration. Um, I mean, beyond the whole pol political and then, and, and, and um, and economic uh, factors. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Maher. Okay, guys. But Hamza also wants to talk, so I don't want to be the okay. Um, I just want to add uh, like a simple analogy with some colors and i'm sorry for everyone who is colorblind if you don't get what i'm gonna say now, but I want to let's say imagine the host country to be a big bubble that is blue and i am f coming from a different country and i'm a small bubble that is red integration i mean i can join that blue bubble and become blue as well and that's what the guiding culture that we discussed about uh, before would be like they want me to conf to conform to the to the bubble and yeah just be like them completely and that's one way of doing it then there is the other way where i join but then i try to search for other red bubbles and just make a big red bubble within the blue bubble and that would be also one way to create like some clusters some ghettos within the society it's also not ideal i would say then there is the other one where um, I joined the blue, the big blue bubble, but I see a lot of different colors there and they are very well mixed. Like it's not big clusters, but very well mixed. And that would be like this inclusion, this diversity thing. And I think what's, what, uh, go, go ahead, Kai, sorry. I, I'll just finish with the last one. What yeah. has said the other level, like the belonging would be that I bring my red color and I give a red tint taint to this blue so the blue would after some time also shift a bit and become for example purple or any mix of colors that have been there for a long time so that's how the i imagine all those concepts that we have talked about how they would fit in this color system but um yeah malik you wanted to say something yeah i think what's funny with immigration that um you want you you would never make a perfect blue bubble you would always be red inside, maybe have some of the blue, but then you would realize that all the red, yellow, green that came 
have that similarity with you so then you can make your own like like a good bubble all together you know <laughs> but which is which has so many colors so i think that's one of the best things in immigration and i talked earlier about immigration being a, a richness that you would meet like so many colors to be so much fun so someone who would like reduce you for being a migrant is like he's just blue you know <laughs> thank you for the very colorful uh, yeah analogy i really love that mm. yeah yeah i just want to react to uh, Meheb, um I, and also what or has been said by Qais and then malik uh, i i strongly agree i think it's just about matter of terms uh, integration is a very um, you know, uh, uh, heavy uh, concepts uh, in in politics, in in uh, in all the public debate and so on. Uh, I am extremely <laughs> agreeing with you. Of course, you when uh, you are able to speak the same language, you are able to actually form something of a community, <laughs> and uh, and this is extremely important. And you need this, and I need this too. That uh, one could also answer that. Uh, you could also, I don't know, <laughs> uh, speak different language in Italy than Ital Italian and still, you know, manage to uh, be in the community, to feel included, to have a sense of belonging and so on. Uh, but integration is, uh, is uh, to me, it's very different. It's, uh, it's really about, uh, as Kais put it, it's about participating to society. And, uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, everyone knows that uh, the whole <laughs> sub-economy sub, sub of the United States, it's uh, by uh, uh, Latina and Latino workers that, much of them do not speak uh, English, uh, but still they are very essential to this to this country, to the society. And the same thing in France. Uh, all people working in uh, I don't know in constructing, in uh, in uh, in in restaurants, in uh, in so many fields of economy. And I'm just speaking about economy because it's, uh, it's very easy and concrete. But uh, uh, you can find so many examples of uh, people having a very essential role of you know in the society, but still. <laughs> um, they are not viewed as this. They are said to be not integrated. So I was actually reacting to this, to this, uh, to th this uh, uh, very uh, narrowed <laughs> definition of integration, which is, I think, the uh, the most common one in the public debate and the public uh, and the pol public policies and so on. Uh, yes, but I, I strongly agree with you, with you. Of course, uh, one should have a community. One should have people to speak to. But uh, you know, it's uh, often as uh, migrants from uh, post-colonial countries. It's not really what's uh, uh, wanted from us. <laughs> uh, it's not really what's wanted from us to, you know, uh, just being included and uh, being a part of community and so on. It's uh, in many cases just being able to uh, uh, give something, <laughs> you know. Um, and in this, in that regard, what you say about the welcoming part is, of course, extremely important. I agree. I strongly agree. The senior, we can't hear you. Okay, sorry. So if you think that in the that still does not exist, all migrants like um, overcame all the, those barriers regarding the language, did everything, checked all those boxes regarding integration, they would still feel some burdens because of their migrant background. We we didn't hear anything, but that's because I mean you have to speak a bit louder so that Zoom recognizes that you're talking. Otherwise, it mutes. You. I am trying my best. Yeah, now now it's good. You just come closer okay. to the mic. Yeah. Okay, I try to come closer. So I was saying that for perfect world that maybe never exists, if all migrants no, they still don't hear. We hear you now. Like the last bit, we heard it. Okay, so the question was like, if all migrants, like they overcame all the barriers uh, related to integration or inclusion or they bl blue, red, bubbles, everything, and they speak the language perfectly and they try their best, would they still be feeling some burden because of their migrant background? Do you sometimes feel like maybe this language or any other things is like some pretext because we always would like them to do more or to prove themselves more. Um, I, I think I might have an answer for this. Um, like when we talk about integration, I think it's better to perceive it in an active way, not in a passive way. Um, so 
I, I, I really feel sorry now that, you know, there, there's these elections uh, that's happening and like they are preparing the elections in France. And one of the major topics here is immigration. But then when you see the actual debates, you don't see any immig like representative of uh, immig immigrants. All, politic all politicians are talking about immigration, thus there is no immigrant to talk to. So I think if we, uh, us as immigrants or migrants, or we keep that position of uh, not being proactive, not um, trying to participate in the um, in this debate, then it would always be like this. So I think one of the ways it's just don't wait for people to integrate you, create your own uh, community, integrate yourself, do your own stuff. And then like, it would be a logical thing. If you are doing stuff, then people would see you doing stuff, you know? So I, I think one way of like uh, answering to this um, problem is uh, just don't like croiser les bras. Um, I, I don't have the word in English, but just try to be active, do stuff, uh, and then things would change. And I really want to to talk about like this initiative, Borderless. Uh, actually, it started just with three organism, organisms working together, trying to do something. Uh, I mean, and the results were incredible. You know, uh, we could uh make our voices heard um we were financed by public funds so if you don't do anything then people won't come to you if you start doing stuff then they would come to you and you would feel more integrated thank you malik um yeah and we also had this question uh some time ago uh between us like friends about what uh because we were also having the elections in Germany, and the question came about uh, in the debates that were, they were politicians were not talking about migration or migrants. They didn't feel represented. So we were discussing what is our role in this, what we can do now as functioning citizens, as Kai said, to make our voices more heard. And um, this leads me to uh, my next question to both of you, Hamza and Kai. So uh, what are, according to you, like the best uh, practices in terms of integration policies in Europe? And we know now that there is this whole debate about integration. And now this is like elections in France and we had these elections in Germany. So every time we have elections, it's like the this word of integration comes and this wave of immigration politicians surf on it again. So, but when it comes to policies concretely, what should be like the best uh, practices in terms of uh, integration policies. Guys, I I can start. Yeah. Um, so for me, since I define a good integration as someone who is able to function, for me it's very crucial to to have uh, early on uh, language courses. So depending on when the, the this uh, immigrant joined, but usually I'm talking, let's say about second generation immigrants who, who have children that grew up in households that don't speak the, the native, the, 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 the home country language at home. I think it's the policies that are very crucial and important are to offer um, uh, extra tuition courses or something that would enable them to, to catch up with uh, their peers. And uh, that's for me the, the key uh, to everything else. So that's the policy that I would definitely encourage. Thank you, guys. Um, so you emphasized on the role of and importance of language. Um, thanks. Uh, what about you, Hamza? What do you think the best practices uh, should be? Yeah, I'm not a specialist on um, on policies at all, but um, I, what I would like to say is I'm very close to what Maha said earlier. It's that uh, the problem is of immigration is not the migrants one; it's the one who receives, who welcomes, would not welcome the the migrants. Um, you know, there's this very famous uh, uh, quote of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. He said that there is no Jewish problem, there is an anti-Semitic problem. And it's very true. Of course, I'm not drawing comparisons about the actual phenomenon, but about the who, who, who's got a problem with what. Uh, you know, it was, it's funny to, uh, 
because uh, earlier you were saying I don't know it was maybe you Malik uh, said that uh, there is there is no uh, immigrant uh, representative in the uh, in the uh, French elections going on. Um, I, I can understand what you're saying, but it's not entirely true. I think because there is Eric Zemmour who was you know born in, uh, his parents born in Algeria and uh, is <laughs> from an Algerian uh, um, perspective. Uh, but uh, the the good immigrant, uh, you know, the only one who is accepted in the public debate is actually the one who says that all immigration except him is bad. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very funny because he's actually the, uh, by himself, by being what he is, he's proving a point saying that, you know, uh, there should be no, no immigration except the one who accepts to uh, attack all other immigration. So I think, again, the very problem of immigration is not immigration, it's the, uh, it's the ones uh, who are welcoming or not welcoming. Uh, on the more concrete side, uh, I think that's, uh, again, uh, with this idea that the problem is not social integration, it's uh, really about political integration. I think that's maybe one thing that is very important to me, at least for, uh, um, yes, for a be better, I don't know, uh, more inclusive society, if I may, uh, it's uh, just uh, to teach uh, everyone, not only immigrants, every people in this society, how society works and how one should, uh, 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 you know, how, how this could be changed, how, how, what are the rules, what, what, what can be changed, what, where, where is the, 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 sphere, the sphere of debates. I think this, in sociology, we call this reflexivity. And I think the only thing maybe should be done is this, is, you know, uh, to, um, to create space for individual, for uh, communities, reflexivity. This is uh, maybe my point. Yeah, and Cyril, if I may, I, I want to say something. I want to comment actually on something. I'm not very fan of the whole um, of the discourse that was being said here, which is uh, like an integrated migrant or something like that is someone who is functioning in society. I really don't like that at all. And maybe because it's coming from an idealistic perspective, I, I admit. But for me, society, if we leave migration alone in society, and if we take society, we don't just have functioning people. And what do we mean by functioning? Like working, you know, we're not all success stories. So this kind, I'm afraid that this kind of discourse is saying that it's actually what the colonizer <laughs> want or what the whole society want is that, okay, we only accept people who are qualified. Otherwise we don't want you. I don't believe in that. I believe that people like have the right to go where there are better opportunities, whether it's for dignity, like for dignity, it's like as basic as that. And again, I, I am very aware that this is very idealistic and it might not uh, be liked but, but by many people, but the whole functioning, I don't like it because for me, it's just that, I mean, for me, it means that, I don't know, like if, if it means that the migration has to, or people who migrate have to be very uh, highly skilled or highly qualified people. And this is exactly what they want. Otherwise we don't want you, you know? So uh, I had some, some discomfort also digesting that, that, uh, that idea. And I wanted to, um, to voice it out because really, I mean, again, whenever I'm like, I feel a little bit uh, blocked or stuck, I always look at nature and look at nature. I mean, birds, they migrate. I don't know, like, I know I'm saying just like very stupid stuff, but my point is just the way diversity exists in nature, migration is also very natural, you know? But with us human beings, we tend to add, of course, complex layer and profit and benefit and intellect and whatnot. And we try to restrict what is very not natural and normal, you know, the, the flow of people, of these species around the world. Again, sorry if my discourse sounds very idealistic, but I just really don't. Uh, for me, if the motivation to migrate is very valid, if you would like a better future or a better life, that's it. It's not idealistic. It's okay. It's perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I also want to thank you for making the argument for um, freedom of movement. I mean, as, as a basic human right and um, emphasizing the fact that all the borders and the barriers that we put are actually social constructs uh, that go against the, the nature. But let me defend the concept of functioning. I mean, it goes actually along the lines that you mentioned before, like two years ago, you didn't feel integrated because you couldn't make uh, jokes or anecdotes or or anything with um, cashier in the supermarket. So 
for me, functioning is that, being able to communicate with the people around you in the environment. Hamza mentioned, for example, uh, migrants uh, in the US like Latino and Latinas who are uh, don't speak the, the let's say English but for me that's not a successful uh, case of integration because they usually are abused and they don't have uh, the means to to change their situation they don't know exactly what the rules are what their rights are they and they are vulnerable so they would be functioning in a good way if they have the means to participate in social life that is to be able to communicate and know the rules and the possibilities that are their rights to 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 be part of the society where they they are so it's not really about being productive as uh, highly qualified it's more like yeah. being aware of your rights and being able to communicate with the people around you that's it yeah, maybe, sorry, then maybe it's my interpretation of productivity. And I no, but it, it's good that you, we clarified it. It's really yeah. important. And thank you for it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah thank you for that. Because we also, uh, it was not also very clear for me, like, what do you mean by functioning? Because mm -hmm. also it was mentioned in the chat. I read it somewhere. You can also see it. Um, uh, where is it? Anyhow, I, I saw it about this uh, function, but here. Yeah. yeah. So do you believe like ICE functioning in the society is important for an immigrant? Isn't it important for any human being, wherever they are in their home or host country? And uh, do you believe there is an additional responsibility that comes with being immigrant? So the question came here. But I, I, I think like functioning, what, what Kais meant, like it's not the mechanical functioning, but the uh, being alive, actually functioning as a human being, you know, all, all what it takes uh, from us, like as aspects. So I think, yeah. Hmm. But yet, like for instance, for me also, uh, it, all, it was also one of the questions you asked earlier in Celine about uh, the migrant, even if they, they, they do all what it takes to be integrated or accepted, they still feel some burden, whether that's true or not. I think this also goes back, this is why I said I'm very, I'm, I'm, I really hate <laughs> the whole uh, added value of migrant thingy because I feel that, um, yeah, the, 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 the underlying assumption is that you always have to prove something to someone, okay? Um, uh, and in this case, in this very specific context, you have to prove yourself to the society that's hosting you, okay? And so if, if, if I mean, so whatever you're gonna, whatever you're gonna do, I mean, you're always gonna be the migrant in their eyes. So you, you always feel, um, how to say, you always feel the need to, um, to impress them, to, to, to make them think of you as well. Oh, but she's not like the other migrant uh, people. He's not like the other, he's the exception, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, for me, it, it shouldn't, like, I think we should th think and perceive beyond that, regardless of why you are here. I mean, um, and here maybe also Kais meant by the function is like, so the functioning of any human being, as Firas mentioned in the chat, so I, it's not contingent of migration, you know, if that's what he meant. This is why earlier I thought he meant like, okay, you have to be functioning, you have to have a job, you have to add some value to the society where you like to the host society, and it, it created some discomfort. But now I got it, it's clear. Thank you, Maher. Um, yeah, it's true also, and it's something that uh, many migrants relate to the this concept of not good enough whatever you do you are not good enough so it's something that we we heard it and uh we heard stories about it so it's definitely something that is there um hamza 
Yeah, I, I just want to second what uh, you've been saying, Isreen, and also Mahe, and uh, all of you, really, uh, about this idea of not being enough. I think it's it's true. It's absolutely true. And it's not just floating somewhere and, you know, there are just some bad people saying it at some crucial moments. It's actually the very structure of immigration. When you ha ask for papers, you know, you are, you are uh, classified, you know, whether you are, you know, having good studies, maybe you change over the course of your studies. I have many friends, for instance, who, uh, yeah, they got OQTF, <laughs> uh, which means that you did the order to quit the French territory uh, because they changed the course of their studies. You know, they were studying like economics and they started say, say, studying Spanish and uh, this was already too much. Uh, and uh, also myself, I, I think my record, my, my best performance for immigration papers was like three years, three years of not having to care about immigration papers. And it was actually uh, featured, my papers was, was, uh, was called pa Passeport Talent. <laughs> which means, you know, I was something exceptional. And this is why they gave me three years <laughs> and not just, you know, six months or one year. And, and so, so, no, this is at the very core of uh, uh, the, the state's view of immigration. This is why I was earlier saying in maybe a bit too theoretical, but it's very practical that there is no problem of immigration. There is a problem of welcoming of uh, the people who are welcoming immigration. Not, not, there is no problem of immigration by itself. <laughs> there is a state problem. <laughs> Yeah, I think the same way with diversity. There's no problem with diversity, but whether you like, what do you do with that diversity? You know, do you accept it? Do you judge it? Do you do you uh, reject it? So I mean, and also migrant migrants can also fall under that umbrella of diversity. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so I don't know if you have our. Um, Maybe comments or remarks or things that you would like to share or add, any one of you. Um, think it's the end of our <laughs> webinar and uh, chat, and you also uh, and thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, yeah, the stream because it just uh, it didn't hear you very well. Yeah, you froze. <laughs> Again, <laughs> she, she's not like you actually. Yeah, yeah, we hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Today, like the the sound, the internet, they were not integrated. <laughs> <laughs> we tried our best. Um, so yes, what I was saying that if you have any other uh, additional comments or uh, things that you would like to share because I think uh, we reached the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, I saw that in the Zoom chat, you interacted every one of you um, with the uh, questions and comments of the audience. So it was uh, questions. And um, I really would like to give you the floor if you have anything uh, to add or something maybe that we did not cover or that you wish to uh, to share or to add? I will just add that um, being a migrant is a positive thing, that we shouldn't need to feel reduced to, to being a migrant. Um, and then um, if like being a migrant, you like you don't feel integrated and like I'm talking about some people who might find themselves not integrated, then maybe try to uh, be more active about it. Um, and I think that there's so much work to do. We shouldn't be waiting for institutions, public institutions in Europe to come to help us. But if we need something, it's our right. Uh, and then we should uh, go for it. So uh, yeah, just be positive about being a migrant first and then being active uh, to make your um, quotidien better your daily life better. Thanks, Melik. Guys? I love the fact that uh, Melik brought up the positive uh, aspect. Uh, I just want to uh, enlarge a bit the discussion because we are all a bit privileged as migrants, but there are other part, other types of migrants uh, that are, for example, brought to work as domestic um, helpers and then their passports are confiscated and things like that. And for me, I mean, even though they are wanted, like the, it's organized by states, but for me, they are not functioning citizens or participants in society because their rights are limited and 
the, their freedom of movement is limited and so on. So there are other parts, other types of migrants that I think from our privileged perspective, we need to not forget and um, try in I, a certain way to, to, to defend them, yeah. I think you will like the next episode uh, of uh, the web series and also the uh, the next episode of the webinars. It will treat some of I liked these, uh, all the episodes, so yeah. Thank you. Hamza? <laughs> Yes, I, I was planning on saying something which is a bit uh, a contretemps, but I'm uh, apologizing in uh, in advance. But I would just want to react to what uh, Kais said because you you say that earlier, and I, I wanted to react already then. But uh, it's truly just about where, where you on what you put the light when you say that. I agree with you, of course. We have this uh, whole system of kafala, for instance, in the in the in the the Khaliji countries and also in some parts of Europe also. Um, and uh, uh, but you know when you're saying that people these people are not functioning, it's I, I completely understand your point and I agree with you. But it's like you're saying that the problem is with them, <laughs> but the problem is not with them. It's obviously not with them. It's the you know the uh, this, I don't know this hierarchy, the system that uh, welcomes them or not welcome does not welcome. I, I know that's what you're saying. <laughs> I'm absolutely not uh, agreeing with you. I, I just had, uh, sorry, uh, this is the part which is a bit a uh, but uh, uh, we, we, we are all sitting in uh, European countries and uh, uh, so we are speaking of our experience as a uh, uh, Tunisian, Moroccan migrants in in, in European countries, and uh, I, there is a, just another side of that that uh, I think we we tend not to stress in this uh, kind of conversations is that uh, we did left something. Uh, we did left something for some reasons. Uh, some of us were well, they they leave I don't know Tunisia or Morocco for studies, but we did not come back, <laughs> and I think there are, there are reasons for that. I think there are there is something of a, an underlying criticism to what we left that we should at some point I think we should uh, explicit that I think this is what why actually I was saying earlier that uh, maybe the only thing that I do feel that uh, it has to do with my actual experience of life is migrants more than Moroccan more than French more than Belgian more than anything is that there are reasons why I'm now sitting and living in Belgium and not in Morocco or, or, or even if even if I, I love Morocco more than or Moroccan people more than <laughs> more than a lot of uh, other things in, in in life. So I think there's this whole other side of uh, immigration, not only as immigration, but as emigration. You know, as uh, uh, leaving something. Yeah. Can I say something about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah I think what uh, Hamza was saying also reminded me of uh, of what Melik was saying in the sense that he said he. He rather ident identifies with the migration experience, so with other people migrating, than the fact of being, for example, Tunisian or something like that, because it makes sense. Because what all of these people have in common, it's like most they most likely have the more or less the, the sim similar motives that led them to migrate in the first place. So this creates some sort of another community. Like if this is the home country. And this is the host country. There's a medium in, 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 in between, which is the, all the people who migrate, that it doesn't really matter where they're coming from or where they're going. It's just that they have the, the, the same motives, you know, like the, the common motives for them that led them to migrate in the first place. Um, uh, also, yeah, uh, I wanted to comment about what Kai said about us being privileged uh, migrants. Um, yeah, this is why for me, like for instance, I hate, I, I really hate the whole high, uh, highly skilled uh, or low profiles, high profiles of migrants. And okay, I may, I may fit under high profile or something like that because I'm, I have some educational degree. But at the same time, for me, it, it makes no sense, and it's not acceptable at all not to empathize with the migrant who comes from my hometown Mahdiya and to to be a fisherman here in Italy you know for me we're, we're the same like I have the respect from a third point of view like which would be the, the person from the host society should respect us equally not me not like respect me more because I have like you know high higher education it's, it's nonsense uh but that's also it it's also this is coming from the way actually uh in our society like migration aside we do tend to respect the the more educated so it's just like replication of that in the migration context uh and finally there's i think we missed um, a comment by ines who said 
that we need to talk about inclusion and not integration. Only then we will have a rich society with different equal cultures with no separation or segregation. And this actually made me think that the terminology of integration, it can the underlying assumptions that we are um, surrendering to something bigger, which is what uh, Kai said earlier, like the blue, the big blue dot and the red we want us to, like you want to be blue to become blue and it also uh, reminded me of the whole guide and culture concept but when when you talk about inclusion maybe as terminology we're all there and we all coexist and we're all heard you know so there's no surrendering or fusion within the dominant culture which is of the host society and i think this is very critical and it's very hard to be implemented in our society it's because I think it's ego. So like our own ego reflected in society. So if you come to my house, you play by my rules, you know? So if, if you are the guest in my house, how dare you like imply or implement your own rules? You have to respect my property. So there's this, I mean, this is a very simplistic uh, example, but I feel it's what the whole societies also feel, you know? So you are coming to my, to our country. We have our culture. You have to, Make and meet and integrate. There's no, uh, it's not bi bilateral, which is very, very dangerous because it should be. Because if you open your doors to me, then it means that you are somehow willing to learn something from me. So it becomes some sort of cultural exchange. It's not just one way, you know? Uh, yeah, and that's it. But these are my reflections. Thank you. <laughs> Bravo, Mahav. <laughs> thank you, Mahav, for and thank you all for uh, this uh, reflections. We have like this question now from Firas. Um, do you guys make a difference between multiculturalism and interculturalism? I think interculturalism is more important. Uh, I don't know who wants to comment on this um, question of uh, Firas about multiculturalism and interculturalism. Guys, any ideas? I don't know what interculturalism means. I know multiculturalism. It would be the example with the different colors within the blue dot. But what would be interculturalism? Maybe another painting. <laughs> I think <laughs> other colors. Uh, Firas, if you would like to expand more what you mean by interculturalism, please feel free to do. Uh, Mahe? I think in interculturalism, there's this idea of exchange. So cross-culture, interculture. Mm -hmm. So while multiculturalism is just having diverse cultures in the same place, interculturalism or cross-culturalism is actually doing that, going the extra mile and doing something to, to, uh, to I don't know, to communicate, to negotiate. So it's like me knowing more about your culture, you knowing more about my culture. So it's like more proactive. Is that what you meant, Firas? Yeah, I, I said yes. yes. Yeah. I think that's a different, the difference between the Canadian model of immigration and the European models of immigration, where Canadian is more of interculturalism and European is more of multiculturalism. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I would like really to thank you all for this very uh, enriching uh, and insightful debate. Uh, and yeah, I think we can talk about hours and hours and hours about the topic of migration, inclusion, belonging. Um, also the fact wh what Hamza said, like we are here, we didn't come back. So many of us, like not necessarily us here, but many migrants feel this like dilemma about you leave your country, but your country does not leave you. Should you go back? Uh, should you stay? When is the best time to go back? Maybe when you go back, you don't belong there. But here in the host country, you also feel you don't belong. It's like a never ending uh, circle of questions and dilemmas. Um, and I just hope that uh, we reach the point where everyone is just feels him or herself in any place he or she chose or they chose to live in. Uh, so uh, thank you all and um, for this uh, very uh, interesting uh, exchange. And uh, I, I encourage you uh, to follow our um, social media channels and pages. Uh, to know more about Borderless and the upcoming uh, web documentary and uh, webinar. 
uh, which will be uh, the last editions for this season. And if you have uh, any comments or suggestions, please feel free to reach out uh, to our um, to us either on um, on on Facebook or LinkedIn uh, or by email. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Nasreen. In other uh, episodes. Thank you. Thank so. you, everyone. Thank, it was you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.